you know, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about your bowel habits and if you have diarrhea or constipation or bloating or gas. I mean, these are all things you don't want to. Um, so it's there was a lot of shame associated with that term or, or with these kind of symptoms. Professor Mai, you've been at the forefront of, of research into the intricate relationship between the gut and the brain for, for many, many years. I was hoping you could give an explanation to somebody who maybe hasn't given much time or consideration to their gut health or the relationship between the gut and the brain, why it is so important for overall health. The term gut health, it's an, it's an interesting um it's an interesting term because, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist. I've been trained in uh, diagnosing and treating gut diseases, not deal with gut health. I mean, obviously gut health was something I would bet that in my career, that word never came up, you know, until about a couple of years ago. And now it's, you know, people embrace it to address a variety of different aspects of um, so I think now a lot of people do associate gut health with overall health and well-being and, um, and uh, you know, feeling good, um, linking that to nutrition, but also linking gut health to um, absence of anxiety, absence of depression. So, you know, to be honest, I've not been concerned in my career and you know, treating thousands of patients um, with gut health for a long time. That has changed, I would say, about five years ago, so a couple of years into um, the publication of my book about the mind-gut connection, where a lot of feedback came from from readers and from podcast hosts and questions about gut health. So, I mean, what is it? You know, you, it's... Um, it's not a term that you would find in a medical textbook or in a scientific textbook. It's something that's evolving. And I, I think it's, um, I think it's a good term, particularly because it links what goes on in your gut with your brain and your overall functioning and well-being. So it's like a, a holistic term of wellness that has aspects of, um, you know, that you, of, of, of actionable items, um, healthy diet, uh, mindfulness, all this feeds into this brain-gut connection and overall gut health. Why do you think then in the last five years it's become such a hot topic? Because from your experience previously, the gut, I think, would be something that people only took notice of when something went wrong, when they had some kind of, of gut issue. For everyone else, you were kind of just getting on with your life without thinking about it. Where's this shift come from where now gut health and the relationship between the gut and the brain seems to be so central to, to many people's thinking and around their diet, their nutrition, their sleep recovery, every facet of their life? It's a very interesting question. I mean, obviously, there, there's one entity of gastrointestinal disorders. is used to be called functional disorders. Now they're called disorders of brain gut of gut-brain interactions. Like irritable bowel syndrome is a typical example, more common in, 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 in women. Um, but that's a disease or, or a disorder that um, patients wouldn't really want to talk about in public. You know, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about your bowel habits and if you have diarrhea or constipation or bloating or gas. I mean, these are all things you don't want to. Um, so it's there was a lot of shame associated with that term or, or with these kind of symptoms. And, and it went beyond just irritable bowel syndrome, which is a relatively narrowly defined aspect of these. But we know that when we ask, when we put gave questionnaires to patients with IBS, they have a range of other symptoms. You know, the, the range is from almost 90% with anxiety, uh, um, but also other types of discomfort and pain in their body, brain fog. So all these things that are, come, are coming up now in terms of in terms of gut health, they, they were always there. And, and one interpretation is because this, this topic has become now um, acceptable, the, the shame is gone, everybody now can talk about it. And you can, uh, so if, you know, at a dinner party or with your friends, you can say, yeah, I have a gut health issue. 
and I'm doing this for my gut health. So I think it's a, a change in the awareness um, and in the tolerance of society to listen to people that, that have these symptoms, which they which they probably have always had. And um, But you had to sort of sweep it under the carpet because it, it's not something – most physicians, students – didn't believe it when people said, you know, there's something wrong. I, I don't feel well. They, they would say, well, we've done an endoscopy. We didn't see anything. Your gut is fine. But for the patient, the gut health was not fine. You know, they had all kinds of symptoms. So do you think it's a case of not only it's more acceptable, socially acceptable to talk about some of these issues around digestion? Do you also think there's an element that these conditions are becoming more widespread? I'm thinking more of modern lifestyle, a lot more stress, uh, dietary choices, sedentary lifestyle. Do you think actually there is a case or there is an argument to be made that more people are being affected by these issues because of the way we're living in the Western world? Um, that's, that's certainly the case for certain brain-gut disorders or would this brain-gut microbiome interaction plays a role. Um, yeah, because in the last 75 years, the changes in our lifestyles has been dramatic. And I would identify maybe, you know, three, three aspects um, that have increased over 75 years, but even have been accelerated over the last few years, I mean, since the pandemic. So one is, um, one is the diet, clearly the Western diet, um, standard American diet. Uh, you know, it's well known in the meantime what the problems are, um, ultra-processed foods, um, lack of fiber, um, too much sugar mm. being, being the main f factors. So that's definitely something that has, has not gotten better for the majority of people. The other thing is the anxiety that people are experiencing around, you know, all these major crises that we have been going through or are anticipating or just around the corner from, mm. from the pandemic, um, constant worry you might get infected and um, to, um, you know, climate change being maybe one of the most threatening at, at the moment. But there's in the U.S., for example, with the elections, you know, that this collapse of agreement in a democracy. There's a lot to be worried about, isn't there, globally? There's, there's a lot to be worried about. And um, even if you are not, um, you know, an avid newsreader, I, I think in the background, this is always there, particularly for, for young people. There's, there's this, this increasing amount of stuff that's worrisome about the future in which they, I mean, we can deal with this as, you know, at our age, but I think for young people, they have it all ahead of them. And um, so anxiety has increased significantly uh, during the pandemic and, um, I mean, the way we're going, I, I think that I don't see any any signs or any positive signs that this will actually slow down or 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 or, or go away. You know, and, uh, there's also the worry. Um, that, you know, so we have we had this pandemic. It's it's not going. It, it wasn't a one-time thing. I mean, like most scientists will say we will see more of these and they can could even be more severe and you know it's, it's uh, so it, it's um so both the anxiety has been increasing and the, the dietary stress uh, i call both of these different types of stresses mm -hmm. and i always emphasize our our bodies our brains our evolution has equipped us well to deal with acute stressors like you know crossing the road and almost being hit by a car or, um, or you know, the, the wild animals chasing after you. But that system that's so perfect and has assured the survival of the human species does not work well or at all for chronic stresses as we are experiencing now. So I think humans probably really have had a time where that chronic stress level gradually keeps increasing and we're trying to mobilize our acute stress systems. They fail. They actually become counterproductive. And um, 
There's a couple of other things like lack of exercise is, is another mm -hmm. thing that we know. Uh, our sedentary lifestyles, you know, most adults spend 95% of their, their life sitting and not, not walking around or running or, um, so there's, there's all these things that have an influence. Um, sleep is another one, disturbed sleep, poor sleep. They all converge on that system of, I would say homeostasis, you know, between our brain and our gut. And now we can also include the microbes in that homeostatic system. But it's, it's influenced by all these various inputs from that in, from a, from a changing world around us. 